Australian ambassador Kim Beasley here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Vinny. We have a couple questions for you, and I uh, hope you'll uh, be, appreciate your answering them. And uh, our online viewers have uh, actually asked some of these questions, so I'm happy to ha happy to have you here to answer some of them. What are the top issues that President Obama and Prime Minister Rudd uh, will discuss during the President's visit to Australia, and what are the key outcomes that you hope to see from this trip? Well, some elements of, the, of their agenda will be multilateral. I think there will be discussion there about a Asian regional organisation, uh, particularly as the uh, President will be coming from, from Indonesia, where that's a, that's a hot topic too, so there will be that. I think the rest of the uh, of the issues that they discuss will probably um, encompass the, the modern bilateral agenda. There'll be material there on uh, on environmental matters, particularly global warming. There'll be uh, issues related to scientific collaboration, educational collaboration. There'll be a reiteration of the fact that we have a very strong strategic relationship, and uh, so the 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 essential defence or military underpinning of the American alliance will also uh, receive a degree of focus in their visit. Um, but also, I guess what Australians will hope is that uh, the President and his family have a bit of fun at the same time, <laughs> at least the kids. So with a combination of all those things, it'll be a hopefully both real in terms of tangible outcomes, but also highly symbolic. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with the symbolic in Australian-American relations. The, the symbols are enormously important mm. to the uh, support both sides, but particularly in Australia, the Australian community uh, gives the relationship. Let me, let me ask you about, about regional architecture. It's been one of the buzzwords in town, and, and Prime Minister Rudd has uh, ha earlier stated some views on, on his vision for uh, regional architecture. And then there was some, lately, some comments attributed to him about APEC. Uh, could you sort of tell us where Australia stands now on regional architecture and, and sort of set the record straight on what, well, where, what your views are? Well, I'm glad you gave me an opportunity. I'll take the second part of that right. question first, which is sure. remarks attributed to the Prime Minister on APEC. He was immensely offended oh. by the attribution of those views on APEC to him. They are not views that he has. And a proper reading of the story that was associated with them would reveal that very little seemed to be sourced to anything reliable in relation to the Prime Minister, but reflected the views of the author, so to speak. I that see. is the author of the article. The Prime Minister thinks APEC is a, a very important regional organisation and he's very supportive of it. It's not, however, a, a, an organisation now focused on East Asia. And it is into East Asia that he sees, wants to see regional arrangements complete with a, uh, a proper focus on the, the plethora of issues from the economic through to the social through to the security. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a forum provided that will allow consideration of that and that has been where he has advocated the creation of a new forum. Um, he would be pleased, and the Australian government's already made this clear, with the initiatives emerging from ASEAN last uh, month, which uh, sought American and Russian engagement with the East Asian Summit. Uh, I think the Prime Minister would now think that these are the, this is the most appropriate direction uh, to go in realising the next phase, if you like, of the initiative that he put forward. Okay. Let's turn to trade. Australia has been a, a real leader on trade. Um, maybe the American mm -hmm. Americans, unfortunately, less so. Um, you hosted the last round of the tra Trans-Pacific Partner Partnership, the TPP. What does the TPP mean to Australia? You've already got mm -hmm. uh, free trade agreements with uh, many of the members in the FTA, including the United States. Um, why, why are you spending the time on this, and, and where do you see it headed? Well, I think, firstly, Australia was very happy with the outcome of that first conference of TPP held in uh, Melbourne. Mm -hmm as uh, sitting there defining the issues, or going there and defining the issues that uh, need to be incorporated within a TPP. And I think there is a high level of hope that flesh will be put on those bones very quickly in terms of a high quality first class uh, uh, trade agreement that uh, goes, uh, picks up 
uh, where individual FTAs and to extract from individual FTAs the very best of practice on all fronts and, uh, and a good regional arrangement emerge from it that will subsequently be capable of being joined by a large number of Pacific powers, point one, point mm -hmm. two. This is seen particularly as a good outcome from APEC because it was out of the APEC business area that this sort of discussion uh, emerged, how to remove some of the, in a modern trade agenda, some of the impediments to business that goes just beyond tariffs on individual goods. So that's, uh, that's a, a very good thing. It is true that of the eight participants so far, we have free trade agreements with six of them. Right. And, um, but uh, I think the view is that ultimately this will be a, an arrangement for more than the eight. Uh, also, though, you have to look in Australia's, in the instance of Australian policy, not only to what we want for ourselves, but what we want for our allies and friends. And in the case of the United States, uh, Australians would say this, uh, that the prosperity and the influence of the United States is an Australian national interest. Mm. And um, while we are conscious of a pretty good position from our point of view in a lot of trading arrangements in Asia, we're also conscious of the fact that the Americans is not so good. Mm. And that the American engagement has been less than what we want it to be. So we also look upon this outside the trading framework more strategically as something that might allow the United States to uh, deal with uh, gaps. It's good to have friends like that in the <laughs> neighborhood. Thank you very much. And, and speaking of friends, you know, a, China. China is, uh, has come onto the world stage and the regional stage. How, do, how does Australia think about that, uh, China's entrance and... Uh, you do a lot of business with China, of course. How are you thinking about uh, regional uh, defense and security cooperation with China? The, Ch the Prime Minister made an interesting speech on Australian policy towards China the other day when he announced the creation of a new centre for China and the world and put $50 million into it, mm. Australian National University. That's serious money and it's serious yeah. purpose. The, uh, and what he called for was a new Sinology, and that is one which pays proper respect and regard to the massive tradition that is there behind the Chinese state, a civilization to be respected, and the substantial role that its economic power gives it an opportunity to play uh, in world politics. So one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what the Chinese need in this new Sinology is also a preparedness to analyse where there are points of disagreement and where we think the performance could be better. In particular, he called for uh, ha having regard to a tradition in, in Chinese culture of the candid friend. Uh, here's another expression for it. He speaks Mandarin, I don't. Okay. For me, it's unpronounceable. But I would call it the candid friend. Okay. And that is a person who is a genuine friend but also is prepared to call it uh, when, it, when he thinks you're uh, proceeding down a dangerous or unwise course. And uh, so that is the, he wants to sort of develop a, a real sophistication in handling uh, relationships with, with China. And he also, I think, would want to ensure that uh, people are comfortable with the peaceful rise of China and that comfort will come from a sense of security. And therefore there is an interest uh, for us and for the powers in Southeast Asia, ultimately for the Chinese themselves and for the Americans to see a new balance emerge in regional affairs whereby the military distribution of power ensures everybody's security and underpins a regional arrangement with which everyone can live. I think by all accounts, uh, those of us who watch President Obama work in Asia, uh, we we know that the prime, the president has a very warm feeling for for your prime minister, Prime Minister Rudd, and one of the areas where they seem to have a lot of common interest is climate change. Mm. But recently, your prime minister mm. uh, has it seems like he's pedaled back a little mm. bit on on the climate change, at least domestically. Um, what do you suspect the two leaders will talk about in this in this area when they get together in June uh, in Australia? And what motivated his, his shift, if he did indeed shift? 
Well, the Prime Minister said he pressed the reset button on, on carbon trading, emissions trading. Okay. Basically, he, is, he said he's confronted with a situation where the Labor Party had on the table a proposal, the Labor Party negotiated with the Liberal Party a proposal that the Liberal Party initially supported. And uh, the view was that neither of those positions was going to get through the Senate. Mm. The election was X months away. And uh, therefore, in a situation where you'd had things repeatedly rejected, best to press the reset button and think about it again. Mm. And then he said he is still committed to an emissions trading system. He is going to allow time to percolate back through the system and uh, have a look at what the Chinese, Indians and Americans are doing and then uh, having satisfied ourselves on that front, move Australia forward again in regard to an ETS. But that wasn't the only thing that he said. He also said Australia remains committed to all the targets that were set up, remains committed to massive investments in, uh, in uh, technologies which uh, will ensure that Australia can meet uh, the targets that it's been talking about and to focus on those sort of, if you like, unilateral measures in relation to uh, uh, the uh, uh, dealing with the, the, uh, the question of uh, carbon emissions from an Australian point of view. So the, uh, the Prime Minister hasn't walked away from that and it will be one of the things that will be discussed between the President and the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister and the President get on well. Mm. The previous uh, Prime Minister mm. and, uh, and his equivalent in the White House got on well too. Australian <laughs> leaders and American <laughs> leaders lately seem to be getting on yeah, very well. Seem to be in safety. And, yeah. uh, and I, think, uh, I think there is a similarity in approach and a multiplicity of issues, not just the emissions trading issues, uh, between the President and the Prime Minister and, uh, and that has been good from the Australian point of view. It underpins what is a very close relationship and keeps in place uh, that tradition of uh, good feeling between uh, national leaders uh, so marked for some time now. Yeah. Building on that good relationship and the, mm -hmm. and the tight ties, one of the, one of the agreements that's sort of on the table ahead of this visit is this U.S.-Australia uh, defense trade mm -hmm. uh, treaty that's sitting in the Senate, um, in, our, in the U.S. Senate. What, is the, uh, what does the treaty mean to Australia, and what does it mean to our uh, relationship and our alliance? It means a great deal. The, uh, we're, buying half a, we're buying an Air Force off you at the moment. <laughs> we're halfway through the process, having picked up the C-17s and Super Hornets. We're going to take the Joint Strike Fighter. We're going to look to the United States in all probability to supply um, maritime surveillance aircraft and uh, in-flight refueling aircraft and ultimately Global Hawk and uh, just about anything you care to name. We're your third biggest uh, 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 customer mm -hmm. of uh, defence equipment and it ensures interoperability between us. And the processes of approval at the moment are painful and uh, potentially damaging. Uh, so we want it changed and that cooperation treaty when signed in the terms it was originally put forward would ensure that. However, the process at the wills of the gods in the uh, legislative and administrative processes uh, the United States uh, grind slowly and um, and they're grinding slowly on this one it's it's really needs to be completed and uh, there's many people in the administration and Congress seized of that so one hopes that the goodwill will turn itself into a real product in the not too distant future here here you uh as ambassador if you could grant yourself three wishes that you could accomplish three goals while you're here in washington what would those three goals be look i've got many jobs and uh, <laughs> one of those jobs however it all those jobs get back to an essential point other people determine policy <laughs> to me i am here to implement other people's policy all ambassadors want to leave with the relationship on the right course and the United States even better informed about Australia. I find the United States and people in the United States immensely well informed about Australia, or at least immensely well informed about the good regard in which Australia holds the United States, and it's reciprocated. So you'd want to see that in continuation. I would like to see that the, these various uh, treaties, agreements, undertakings, that will, some of which will be reflected in what the President will be 
discussing with the Prime Minister, some of which you've already mentioned, like this Defence Cooperation Treaty. I would want to see the institutional framework, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the numbers of agreements, really um, even more deeply embedded than they are now by the time I leave this place. And the, and the final thing I think I'd want to see is the United States pay, paying regard to the fact that, and it's a difficult thing for the United States to do when they've got the, the, the problem on their hands in uh, the Middle East and Afghanistan, which is immensely time consuming. And when you've got your soldiers in the field, that's where your heart is. But shifted to the top of the agenda, nevertheless, for the United States, the area that is their sunny uplands. The Asia Pacific region is sunny uplands of the United States, where in the main, uh, the odd incident uh, around the Korean Peninsula accepted, is uh, just basically uh, a, a, a realm of opportunity as opposed to hazard. And that, uh, that this will be reflected in priority in American policy by the time I leave. Ambassador Kim Beasley, thank you very much for coming to CSIS. I really appreciate it. Terrific. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much.